And we're live. This is Plant Daddy Podcast, serving you intersectional horticulture. I'm Matthew. And I'm Stephen. Alright guys, we are back today with a really special collaboration episode. We are talking to Devin Wallian, and he is a fourth generation horticulturist, gardener, plant... Uh, plant hawker. lover. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So hi Devin, welcome to the show. How you doing, Matt? Uh, good. So we are going to talk more about you and your experience and all that in just a minute. Uh, but Stephen, tell me, do you have any plant updates or anything cool going on? Gosh, so I have a huge amount of cuttings uh, that are hopefully rooting in my house right now. I went to an awesome plant swap in Seattle a week or two ago. Um, so I potted all these up. These are a lot of succulents, and hopefully most of these will root. As far as specific plants, uh, I got a new Crassula, and gosh, I don't remember the name of the species offhand, but I will Google it, and then I will um, rudely interrupt later. And- cool. But it's, yeah, I'm really. I'm it's a really neat looking it. one. It has like really pale jade green, kind of mint green leaves. Super fleshy um, yeah. leaves that interlock. Uh, it's kind of like a column shape. Um, but yeah, it's Crassula, something that starts with an M. Anyway, how about you, Matthew? Cool. Uh, well, I am trying to get my plant shipments in before the weather gets super cold. So the last couple of days, I have basically just been like taking multiple orders of plants arriving i have a hoya carnosa crinkle which is a really beautiful plant it's sort of a little bit like the hindu rope hoya uh same species but instead of the leaves being completely curled up to create a really nice mealy bug hotel it just has eight little dimples on the top of the leaves so it has beautiful texture and i've also picked up the hoya numularioides which is a kind of petite one it has pale olive green almost velvety leaves they're really nice and tiny little clusters of bright white and pink jasmine scented flowers so i'm really excited to see those two plants thrive uh which hopefully they'll be able to do i also got my very first south american slipper orchid uh so this is a genus called phragmopedium and they're related to the southeast asian paphiopetalum that everyone's familiar with and some of the temperate ones throughout northern hemispheres that people might grow in their gardens, um, the cypripediums. And so the phragmopedium is an orchid that also grows those really beautiful slippered uh, kind of shapes to the flowers, but they're fairly large plants and they'll carry multiple flowers per flower spike, which will bloom sequentially throughout a season. And they're unique in orchids in that they actually like to have their roots stay pretty wet. They might grow in areas where they are by stream sides and are constantly in access to moisture. So I'm going to try doing this orchid in semi-hydro okay, to see how that works that. out. It sounded like a hydro candidate to me. Yeah, this seems like the top orchid candidate for semi-hydro. Some of the other orchids I've received recently have been like the Neophenicia falcata, some of those vandacious varieties that like to have dry roots. So I've been trying them in like Kokodama balls to kind of see how they go. So I'm excited to see how these plants do and I need to stop buying plants. Um, I only have three more plants that haven't arrived. Well, that's the thing. I was going to be like, yeah, yeah, stop. But you've already offered me one of these. So I'm just going to see how it plays out. Yeah, because any plants that I don't have room for might just show up over here sometime. (sighs) Yeah. But before we dive into our topic, I just want to remind everyone that we can be found on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest as Plant Daddy Podcast and online at plantdaddypodcast.com. You can contact us by email at plantdaddypodcast at gmail.com. And we would love it if you could make sure to rate and subscribe to help others find us. And a really great way to get podcasts known is by recommendations. So if you know any plant friends who need some help in something that you think we might be able to help them out with, go ahead and give us a recommendation. We would absolutely love that and really appreciate it. All right. Anything else before we dive into our topic, Stephen? Uh, yeah, the Crassula I was talking about. Oh, yeah. It's Crassula plegmatoides. Okay, so that's not starting with an M. It, there's an M in it. Okay. Okay. I was hoping that you would like interrupt more rudely than that. I will again later. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm very glad that our listeners now know what that Crassula yeah. is. It's pretty neat. So... 
Devin, um, you have a really cool family story, I think. Can you kind of walk us through that? I would love to. Like how you're yeah. Really involved in, uh, in horticulture. Yeah. You know, my family, we've been involved in the um, horticulture business since around the 1950s. Back in the 50s, I had a super intrepid great grandmother. And in the 50s, if you guys can imagine, traveling around the world was not like it is today. Yeah, it's like boats and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But she, on her own, in the 50s, would travel to the heartland of China. And when she was there, she made horticultural connections. And she would bring plants back to America that her and her husband would sell at flower shows and fairs around the country. Then in 1964 and 65 is kind of when we got our real like, our feet were firmly planted in the horticulture business at that point when we we were selling various plants at the 1964 and 65's World Fair. That sounds cool. cool. Which is, yeah, you know, like I would have loved to be at the World's Fair in 1964 and 65. I think selling plants, she was probably the only person there doing that. Now, what were some of the plants that she was selling? A few of the ones that she was selling were, um, my family calls them tea logs, which most of us would know as Dracaena. So we would sell tea logs as well as like um, the Chinese money tree and lucky bamboo, which back then was like no one had ever seen that in America. Mm-hmm. And so people went crazy for it. Her and her husband were kind of uh, marketing geniuses at the time because they had this crazy idea. Uh, back then, everyone would drink tea from a box, mm-hmm. Lipton's tea. So they had this idea. They contacted Lipton's tea and they said, hey, you know, can we can we work with you guys? Can we put an advertisement on the inside of your box offering, you know, send in three box tops and you'll get a free tea log. So, you know, kind of a play on words. Yeah. And so in exchange, you know, Lipton's tea was like, absolutely. That sounds like a great idea. That's super cool. That's yeah. Like and an old school. Like totally old school. Men esque kind of thing. To yeah, yeah. The original collab. Yeah. So so that was kind of like really solidified our, our desire to continue to bring plants to people. And um, then as her daughter grew up, my grandma, Roberta, she got married and continued on in the, in the family business with her husband. Mm-hmm. And they would just sell plants all around the country at various flower shows and fairs, you know, things like the Philadelphia Flower Show, Chicago Flower Show. I'm from Indiana, so we did a lot of Midwest, Cincinnati Flower okay. Show, some of, the, some of the main hallmark flower shows around the country. And um, when my dad and his brothers came of age, they also decided to go into the, fam- into the family business, but they kind of separated and created their own little Little, their own little businesses themselves. So mm-hmm. my dad had his business called Tropical Treasures. My uncle had Big Island Plants, and they would all ha- had their like their geographical regions that they would kind of tackle. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so my uncle Big Island Plants, he was based out of San Diego, and he would you know sell plumerias, various jasmine, all sorts of really warm tropical plants at you know fairs and flower shows around. Yeah. California, Arizona, Nevada, all of those places. Over time, you know, we we became known as people that would sell hard to find plants, but easy to grow stuff for, you know, wherever they were being sold. Interesting. So when they're selling things like the the plumeria and the jasmine, was that primarily as outdoor garden plants in warm climates or was it as house plants in cooler climates? Well, so that's a good question because, you know, sometimes when we were in California, yes, we would absolutely sell them, you know, put them, plant them right in the ground, you know, mm-hmm. plant this cutting directly in the ground and watch it grow into a tree. But if we were in Seattle, you know, we used to sell plumerias in Seattle. Uh, back in the 90s mm-hmm. and we would tell them all right put this in a you know your container put it outside in the summertime and then when the nights start to get below a certain threshold for plumerias it's like 55 degrees bring it inside and then you can have it as like a uh, as a house plant in the winter time and so that was kind of how that was kind of our our niche back okay. then okay so it, uh, plumeria is an interesting one to mention specifically i have tried to grow these many times indoors yeah and, it can be tough. Yeah. So the first time that I was growing them, I uh, took a family trip to Hawaii like <clears throat> over 10 years ago. And I bought a ton of like Walmart cuttings of that various colored plumes. Sort of shriveled in little plastic bags. Yeah, first exactly. Time I'm hearing this. Interesting. Yeah. And, you know, bright <laughs> stars in my eyes thinking, totally. oh my gosh, I can bring these home and grow them because. There really is nothing quite as special as seeing a plumeria growing outdoors where it's covered oh, the in luscious flowers oh, that smell like coconut and 
yeah pineapple it's like one of the best floral fragrances agreed and they're so iconic of the tropics Mm -hmm. so i can definitely see why people would want to bring these inside but when you're talking to people who are living in like anything below a zone 9b or something yeah how do you help them be successful with these plants well, what I would say is only attempt it if you have particular conditions. Okay. Really. You okay. know, for me, I am lucky enough that I have a balcony that I can put it outside in the summertime. Mm-hmm. I have a southern and a western balcony, so I can create sort of my little heat zone mm-hmm. with it right up next to the window. And then so all summer long, it will, it'll be able to thrive. And then hopefully by the time the, the nights start to get colder and I have to bring it inside, it has enough vitality left in it so that it can remain healthy throughout the winter. Mm-hmm. The problem is with those plants, like you know, getting them to, to just even stay alive inside the home in the wintertime can be really tricky. It's, they're, they're like really highlight plants. Exactly. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like after a Hawaii trip as well, I looked into that like, oh, how do you, you know, how do you keep these plants? Can I have them? And I feel like I just read one or two things and I'm like, this sounds impossible. (laughs) Yeah. But I think that you could like looking around, you have all of these nice little uh, lamps that are keeping some of your succulents thriving. Mm -hmm. I think if you just had two of them situated directly on the plant over winter, it would be happy. Yeah, and you know- Maybe that's a little bit intense for some people. Oh yeah, and you know, that sounds like a lot maybe, but if you are serious about a plant, I mean, it's good to know that you can do that. Because really, I didn't think that that would be enough light either, right? Or I was like, we need so much, I need so much heat for this large plant. But I don't think they actually need that much heat in the wintertime. As long as your apartment is staying above six, it's probably not going to actively grow, but you'll at least have it remain alive. A- another plant that's similar growing conditions to that and can be very tricky is the adenium. Mm-hmm. For years, I would struggle with that because I would leave it outside all summer long and it would look great. And then I'd bring it inside and you guys know in Seattle, you know, yep. the, the sun dips it. <laughs> I'm in the middle of that struggle. Okay, this is a very personal, you know, the adenium right. one for me. So Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. so what I've found is that if the days are like today where the sun doesn't even look like it came out, it's just kind of just... It's been... sort of bright, but it's yeah, not sunny. Yeah, but like, <laughs> did the sun flat. set at 11.45 a.m.? Perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. But for me, what I did was I got one of these $15 clamp-on lights with a LED bulb that doesn't generate any heat, mm-hmm. but I leave it on for 10 hours a day. And not only are my two adenium alive, they're actually producing new foliage right now. Oh, nice. Okay. In the middle of November, which is like, I'm I'm honestly, I am very yeah. pleasantly surprised by that. So, all right, to keep the plumeria <clears throat> indoors, though, just to kind of recap. So you're going to put it in the summertime in as much light and heat as you can. Absolutely. And does that include, <clears throat> like, if you're in SoCal? Would you do it there? You know what I mean? Well, we're, yeah, we're for in sure. Northwest, so yeah. Yeah, if you're in if you're in Southern California, like so, I was just down in San Diego. My little sister lives down there, and um, I was helping her redesign her garden at her new home. And one of the things we planted a plumeria. Now mm-hmm. we were started with like a pretty large five gallon potted plant, and we just transferred it to a, a larger pot. But absolutely, I would put that in the full sun in a container. You know, you could probably do half day of sun and it would be fine, but they they can handle the, the full hot sun okay. all day, every day. Uh, but once they're established, like, you know, you'll look over, over people's fences and you'll see plumerias that are beautiful in a half day of sun, lush as can be. So I think that they can, you know, once they've gotten that solid root system, being in the part sun, part shade is a is a great is a great climatic condition for them too. Okay. So it sounds like as much sun as possible, right? Okay. And then if you're not in, you know, ideal conditions like that, say yeah. so it's outside or it's getting as much sun as it can in the summer. Mm-hmm. In the winter time, you would bring it indoors then when it's going to be fifty five degrees or lower or when That's typically my personal rule of thumb for tropicals that are that uh, that heat loving mm-hmm. is like 45 would probably be all right, but 55 just to be on the safe side. You know, one thing that I'm not familiar with that maybe you guys would know, <clears throat> like the adenium, that plant loves to have that fluctuation in daytime and nighttime temperatures. Yeah. You know, I'll let my apartment get down to like 65 at nighttime and that seems cold, but it loves that. Yeah. You know, going from 75 in the daytime to 60 at nighttime is totally not only, you know, 
fine, but actually helps it to create more vigor. Well, and there's a lot of plants like that. Like I am, I'm not seeing a lot of blooms on my orchids these days because <laughs> uh, to kind of go on a tangent, we have a pet hedgehog and they try to go hibernating when it is below like 70 degrees. So we've been keeping our apartment warmer than usual ah, for Paloma the hedgehog. Yeah. And a lot of my plants do in fact want they want that cold night yeah like yeah. that's that's kind of an important thing for a lot of plants and there are quite a few that can tolerate more heat than you would think as long as they get that nighttime chill like fuchsias are one of those for sure so, yeah but like with a plumeria i've never really thought about that particular parameter because in this growing zone like we have a really good fluctuation between day and yeah. night so it happens automatically but i to kind of get back to the, the the minimum temperatures that you're discussing, if they're growing in areas that consistently get below 50, they tend to defoliate, don't they? Absolutely, yeah. So and if you're growing in like Minnesota or something, and if you have one of these plants, but you don't have a good indoor sunny position, mm -hmm. do you want to perhaps use the deciduous nature of this plant? I would absolutely, yeah, unless you are willing to get a couple clamp-on lights, it will defoliate, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is it easier to care for if it goes full dormant like that without any foliage? I wouldn't say it's necessarily easier or harder. Um, okay. Probably it would require less watering, but, you know, for all of us, we all know how important watering is, so yeah. you just have to check it. But yeah, it sounds like you can have one that doesn't necessarily need to go dormant, Right, if you can kind of yeah. get over those temperatures, and and you said like the adenium likes the cold nights, but plumeria doesn't. Is that the That's difference? something that or I'm not, I'm not sure, sure about. That I would love to know more mm -hmm. about because if I'm I'm visualizing some of the areas where it grows naturally, you know, you'll see it in places all around Mexico where the nights will definitely get pretty cold, um, but yet they thrive there as well. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, they're also you know, growing in Hawaii where the nights never get below 55. So yeah. I'm not, I, I wish I did know that answer more. I, w I would love to experiment and find out. We're actually probably going to do an episode fully about Plumeria later because this is such an interest of mine that this is like our little, like dip our toes in the Plumeria pool to discuss. But uh, I definitely want to explore more about them because there are several different species that are they're super used cool. in the cultivation oh. of these hybrids. So uh, like one of them is a true deciduous plant. One of them is not a deciduous plant. One mm -hmm. of them has spoon shaped leaves. Like there's a bunch of really interesting wow. stuff out there. Yeah. Um, I'm sure they're really hard to find though. Where do you... F I imagine that they are not hard to find if you live in like... Arizona or Florida or you know South California but up here you're never going to find them in nurseries. No and that, you know buying them like as a succulent packaged in a con in a little plastic bag like that like Yeah, they're not happy. They're not happy at all. Mm -hmm. And most I'm surprised if you've ever had any luck with any of those from those bags. Did any of them ever work? Well, I don't think any of them rooted. Yeah. Wow. Some of them. That's harsh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. well, what, well, what I found was that a couple of them just rotted pretty quickly totally. when I put them in their soil. A few of them grew healthy leaves, but just on the reserves that were in that like thick, fleshy hmm. uh, stem cutting. Um, the plant that I currently have, though, now... I received as a rooted cutting. It's a Singapore pink, which is a dwarf mm, variety mm -hmm. that has very, Singapore very... Singapore well, probably my favorite. It is a fantastic one. It's a dwarf variety that's known to bloom reliably under lower light conditions. So I specifically picked this particular cultivar knowing that if I'm growing it in a pot in yeah. an apartment in Seattle where I have two east-facing windows and an east-facing balcony. Like, what can I do to keep this plant happy? I figured that this is the one that I had the best luck with. Yeah, you know, I from from my experience, I feel like the Singapores are often some of the most robust growers. That's good. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, just because they, they're not 
trying to get so large they're content mm-hmm. being small and I, it must be something to do with that which allows them yeah. to just be beefier and just more i don't know yeah what's vi- full what, of life what's really great about it is that i got it about a year ago and it was a three tipped cutting maybe about 18 inches tall mm-hmm. and i put it in a 10 inch pot really really coarse pumicey mix that mm-hmm. doesn't retain very much water and is very fast draining for sure give it a good top dressing of gravel to keep moisture away from the crown and i just put it on my balcony as soon as it had consistent high nighttime temperatures yeah. after growing it under grow lights through the winter and it has put out so many leaves it is a thick wow. bushy plant it looks amazing and how and often looks... were you watering that during the summertime i was watering it really often actually yeah that's the that's the other thing i think like like the adenium yeah. once they get like their root systems they like to be watered regularly but they want to yeah. just they want to drain out quickly yeah like the there have been a few plumeria that i've attempted in between this most recent one and those first ones from hawaii walmarts and what i found was that they were really susceptible to white fly which mm-hmm. is not a pest that i've had on anything else oh gosh i'm very yeah. familiar with white fly on yep. uh mealybug is another big one so is scale oh i didn't realize mealybug was they're just a pest for my particular life i think but i was always struggling to keep these plants happy and none of them worked out and i think that i ended up either underwatering so that they would go dormant mm-hmm. um, or i would overwater and they would rot so this is why i made sure that i use the most mineral mineral mix possible in yeah. order to keep that from happening and because of that i found that i could water it really really freely and it was thriving without ever succumbing to any amount of rot but it also had the brightest light i could provide so that yeah moment. really yeah okay. i yeah because i don't looking around your place i would say that's not the brightest light but it is well when it was outside on the balcony it was in like oh, like got it. the the brightest corner where i keep yeah. my my citrus and my saracenia and those plants that really do require the Want most sun possible okay. so yeah. yeah, hasn't so bloomed it, yet. Okay. Yeah, so, see, that's what I wonder. Is it is it going to be like the adenium for, for the urban gardener, like where you have to try to induce that extra stress? Yeah. Which may mean it is good to have the cooler nights. Yeah. I'm not sure. Now I have it on an on a windowsill indoors, and I'm watering it really infrequently. It's not really lost many leaves, maybe three to five. But you still have some lighting on top of it well it it doesn't have any augmented lights None. it's just entirely getting what it can wow. from an east window that's slightly north of east mm-hmm. and it's it's unobstructed but um people who follow our, our instagram stories might know that i have released some anoles those little cute lizards that you find all throughout the south and in pet stores and one of them in particular Like, the plumeria is his territory. Mm -hmm. He absolutely loves hanging out in it, and it is so cute. So I hope it keeps his leaves so that he continues to have, like, a dense, thick little home. Yeah, so all this struggle is worth it. Yep, all this struggle is worth it. Yeah. So basically, it sounds like if you are really serious about having a plumeria in your home and you don't live in an ideal place, you can achieve it. Give it as much light as possible, right? We're not sure about the nighttime temps if that harms or helps or right because it sounds like yeah you you see them growing in either case so maybe it's kind of a wash it seems like you might be able to just kind of do what you will as long as the other conditions are strong now how do you recommend sourcing these how would you buy one yourself how would you recommend somebody find just one like oh you don't ship it in winter or something you know well i i would look for a for a purveyor that is able to offer fresh cuttings directly from hawaii okay that's how we would do it we would we would we would work with the farm that would supply us with tons of fresh cuttings that had been cut you know 10 days before they would ship them out so they had a chance to callus uh, at the base of it and that's really the only the only way that i would feel comfortable starting a new plumeria is with a, a, a super fresh cutting so you bring this cutting home what do you do with it well get that nice coarse quickly draining potting mix like Mm -hmm. you have potted up and then so for something like that if you're going to be doing it right now you definitely need to have some some augmented light i would say Mm -hmm. um for a lot of my plants when i'm just unless it's in the like you know 
end of spring, okay. beginning of summer, when I can reliably count on the sun being there yeah. consistently for the foreseeable future. So you're saying right now being winter, like if exactly, you're to root in winter. right, right, exactly. But uh, for a lot of my house plants, <clears throat> I have my two. I have two little stations with my um, clamp on lights mm-hmm. and I will put them under the lights for about two weeks just to get them going okay and that seems to be a very like I was just starting one of these um, uh, ficus um, elastica variegata oh yeah and you know I got it as an I got it from an air layer that my professor gave to me and the first thing I did was I potted it up and then put it under my uh, just my additional clamp light and um, had it there for about two weeks, and after that, it, I could tell it was it had developed some new roots. Mm-hmm. It started to grow new foliage, and now I can take it away and, and put put my next plant on my little yeah. my little uh, uh, initiation station. So, nice. so that light is that on ten hours a day? You said or yeah, it's a, it's from about maybe even longer when I let's say eight a.m. till eight p.m. Okay. They're only going to work if you put them within 12 to 18 inches of the plant. Yeah. Any further and you're not really getting any benefit. Unless it's like really high powered, but probably right, can't which... do that with a little clamp on. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is good, right? Yeah. Like this is a good amount to kind of, I mean, I'm interested again because I really yeah. have written Plumeria off like a, honestly a little bit like Adenium is kind of like... That holy Art. grail that's you're just doesn't actually it's exist. Just, yeah. yeah. I'm like, I don't for such a large plant... If we lived in Arizona, needs, exactly, I'd have a whole garden full of them. Yeah, <laughs> I just need some outside I can put it in that it will run itself, and it's just anyway. But this is actually this is encouraging, and like we were saying earlier, your you know your family business has been based in a place that is much colder, right? Yeah, and you've sold it to people, I assume, you know, doing for this sure. for a long time. So that's great to yeah. To know. How much do you water a cutting before it has lots of active growth? Um, the plumeria cutting, yeah. I would just water it and then let it dry out. You know, if you have it on the underneath the clamp light, it will probably dry out in a week. Okay. But that's one where because it's a cutting and it's just getting started, you don't want it to totally, totally dry out. Like, yeah. like once you're established, once your plume area is established, those can will definitely prefer to be allowed to totally dry out between mm-hmm. waterings mm-hmm. Um, when it's inside the home. In the summer, like you were saying, you watered it regularly. But for the cutting, yeah, maybe once and then maybe 10 days later, water it again. So just keeping it like barely moist, just enough for the roots yeah, to less, get started. Less moist than you would for your some of your other tropical yeah. indoor plants. Like though. you'd never grow this in a glass of water to root. It would just I don't think that would paste. work. <laughs> I, I Unless someone has tried and can tell me otherwise, I think that would go that, turn yeah. to instant rot. Like a huge glass of water, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to call <laughs> it as a glass. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, okay. so that's pretty interesting. Um, you, you as a kid, like, watered the plumeria in family that, greenhouse, That was right? kind of my job, yeah. You know, when I think back to when I was growing up, so we grew up in you know, in the Midwest in a suburb of Indianapolis, mm-hmm. and if you guys have, you know, have been to the Midwest, you know... The, Steven's it's very, from there. You're from yeah, the Midwest, from so... Yeah, so yeah. The, the garden life in the Midwest is, you know, people have their, their ways of gardening, as you know, and... Um, my family we just we had this huge greenhouse in the back of our yard like i love it, that <laughs> it was just like i'd never realized how kind of crazy that is uh until i grew up but we had this big greenhouse in our backyard um that was kind of like where we would grow all of our specimens that my dad would then load into a truck drive around the country and and use as his quote unquote display plants mm-hmm. as we would you know sell the cuttings and so when and he was always on the road so my job when he was on the road was put my little boots on go out to the greenhouse and wa- <laughs> and water all the plumerias so, yeah to me that means you have decades of plumeria experience okay. you know I, I do but like... i but i need to get some more i need to i need to start some more i just don't have enough room for it did yeah. you have any right now i don't but oh, okay. it's i but think you got the after this i have a few adenium okay. and um and these are both in the Aponaceae family, so like they're yeah. not too far apart. Yeah, they both have that nice milky sap on the inside. Yeah, kind of the pinwheel-shaped flowers. I'm assuming that we like the same kind of sour smell. 
like if you break like it. Like the sap? Uh, yeah. I've never, I've not noticed that with my plumeria. Well, I have noticed it with the plumeria. I haven't noticed okay. it with the desert rose as much. Yeah. I, I, oh, really? It's stronger, you're saying? Or you have With the plumeria, well, I guess the main I, thing that I remember about the plumeria is I'd get that milky sap on my hands and that was just they'd be sticky for the rest of the day yeah. <laughs> that's my biggest memory sticky here. Latex. <laughs> so as you're offering plumeria to customers uh i imagine that you did that in response to there being a demand for them how do you kind of target what plants are going to be in demand and then produce those well so you call it in yeah, we would call Lipton. See what kind of teas are you guys offering these days? Any any way we can collaborate? All right, I guess we're gonna go a lot of chamomile these days. We knew it. Um, yeah, well, that's, that'll be the next the next plant trend: chamomile plants. Yep. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, that's a great question though, because at this day and age, we work with a lot of different growers and breeders all around the world, and. Um, I think one of the ways that we hone in on what the trends are is we do a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. We go and visit, you know, in America, as you guys know, uh, American gardeners are are very, very far behind in terms of just like general plant loving compared to Europeans. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our ways that we kind of like see where the trends are going. I'm talking primarily outdoor plants at the moment. Sure. I know a lot of this new uh, house plant trending has kind of evolved out of Williamsburg and some Mm -hmm. of the other urban cities in America but so we do a lot of traveling and going going to to Holland especially in Germany England and seeing seeing what breeders are creating what the kind of the latest and great quote-unquote latest and greatest plant yeah breeds out there are so that's one way that we kind of like see what's going on and uh you know in terms of like where things have been going it's been interesting because we have two main different spheres of you know evolving plant taste that we've been noticing we have one mm-hmm. the young urban millennial that is finally getting interested in plants thank god uh-huh. and then you have uh the older generation that has been gardening in their suburban homes for a long time they're downsizing they have smaller yards maybe they're moving into condos um they're they're now having their version of urban gardening uh, or, or urban gardens. Yeah, that's really interesting to think about. You know, now that you're saying that, that's kind of playing out in my own life, right? Like, my parents have been gardeners for decades. Yeah. Um, and they're still, I mean, really They love plants, garden- gardeners, for sure. And now they're just kind of getting into slightly different things. And I can see that track being kind of different. Yeah. I'm, I'm just into totally different stuff than them now yeah but it's like it isn't there is some really interesting uh cross-sectioning there because Mm -hmm. in the end it's both both of us both set both sets have just this need for lots of plant life in small spaces Mm -hmm. so that's been a huge trend that we've been noticing are a lot of uh you know a lot of plant breeds that are bred for dwarf growth habit Uh uh-huh that has been a huge thing for for us particularly i love the idea of that (laughs) now (laughs) it's it's a very i can do more stuff even that cutting that you taught you talked about this hoya cutting yeah of me i looked it up i like confirmed that it was small and then i was like oh yeah sure yeah hoya new (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. so i totally that totally makes sense and i think part of it too right i just have to imagine like if you think back to the pilea pepperomi pepperomioides it's hard okay. to say. I, I don't know. It's tough. Pelea pepperomioides. Okay, you, I, got, you got time to set up. Michael that. Perry okay. taught me how to say that when I listened <laughs> to him on Jane's yeah. podcast. So, but that one, right, with that trend, you saw like the American sort of horticulture industry, I would imagine, being caught kind of flat footed, right? Like those were so expensive people were like, willing to like sell their firstborn for, child yeah. for like a tiny little cutting yeah like for so long that you're kind of like okay you have to look at that or i did as a consumer and i was like well it's just impossible to fully you know guess this or maybe sometimes it comes and these you know different businesses like yours or like others right they haven't had time to make stock for like a year for sure no yeah so i was just visiting one of our guess, but 
I was just visiting one of our growers out in um, Southern California, and he has this new uh, Krasula, not new, but this Krasula Buddhist temple, mm-hmm. which is, oh, it's freaking beautiful. I'm but he was this up right now. Yeah, look it up right now. It is absolutely incredible, but it's an it's a, it's also incredibly slow grower. He was telling oh, me it's going to take yeah. him three years to propagate enough of them oh, in I've order to have it, um, yeah. you know, a, available for his other wholesale, you know, yeah. buyers. So we've seen this before in person. This was at the yeah. um, Cascade Cyclone Society sale. This um, to me looks like if math was a plant. Yes. Like mm-hmm. it's it's just I layered. I, know, I love this. Yeah. The geometry is, is I'm beautiful. I'm kind of myself like, I like it, but then I liked this Euphorbia be some more. And I was just kind of like, oh, Crassel, I'm like, this is going to be everywhere. But now that you're saying that, I'm like, oh, maybe we're not going to be able to buy it for a couple of years. I'm looking at yeah, some which, pictures of them in which... bloom, and they're amazing. Yeah. Oh, I want to see. It's like pink pom-poms, like, crammed all over this, like... That is insane. Like pagoda looking. Plant. I have not seen. I have not seen that. That is beautiful. I sh- now it's making me regret not having snuck one into my pocket before yeah, I just left. Like tuck it in there. <laughs> you wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> so I'm just curious. Like then with this with this pilea craze that happened. Yeah. Like, were you guys like, oh gosh, we need to we respond jump to in this. on that, or was that just not even what you do? I'm kind of curious. How um, did different growers respond to that? We're like, oh gosh, we better get in on it, or yeah. Or, darn we didn't see that well so one thing that for us you know our um customer base is is maybe a little different than okay, so it's kind of not your sweet spot anyway it's not no right. for sure so so currently i didn't finish uh you know we no longer sell at flower shows or mm-hmm. fairs anymore now my family we are purveyors we're uh, purveyors on the tv channel called qvc which is a home shopping channel so we Mm -hmm. cater to a lot of a lot of the gardeners perhaps like your parents Stephen, that are transitioning to their new uh later in life gardens and so for the pilea pepper pepper (laughs) no 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 you get up to it and i second guess myself i know that's what it is it's like I had a plan, and then I just, like, freaked out in the middle of pep. So I'm I know. just going to propose something. <laughs> like, Zamiococca zamifolia, we all just call ZZ yeah. plant. What? Bob Deer <laughs> reminded us that Pilea peperum <laughs> Are we going to call it the PP plant? Yeah. I May don't know. Well. It's so much easier to say. <laughs> everybody, already, everybody already has one. No one's going to be offended. They're, yeah. you know, they're five bucks now. So, yeah, the you weren't that bothered about getting PP plants in your, <laughs> yeah. in your yeah. collection. I had, a, I had a teacher that said... You know, who cares about how to pronounce the Latin names as long as both parties understand what you're talking about. And I I live, I like I live by that motto. Yeah, this be very good. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. You, Matthew yep, yeah. knows what you're talking We're about. We're now going to make this catch on the three of us alone. <laughs> Listen, you're Plus Bob Beer who started it. <laughs> you're, you're embarrassed either way. Okay? Yeah. Either, you know, you mess up pepperomamioides. Or you so own it. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. Just like, get used to it. Sorry, though. I do realize the thought you were getting out. Oh, yeah. Well, so anyways. So, but but like I was saying, you know, some of the the, the nature of plants is a game of patience. So mm-hmm. I am never really concerned about missing a market trend because the market trends last. You know, how long have we been talking about succulents? You know, a while, five <laughs> years at least. And it's not like they they first became popular five years ago. Right, it comes and goes, and they're still wildly popular. Yeah, you, I'm you know to bring up. Instagram, I find that for me, my the sweet spot are, are succulent houseplants. They're still like the most loved of all of pictures that I post personally. Yeah. So that tells me that the trend is still going strong. So I imagine the, the PP plant trend is going to continue for some time. Yeah, I, I'm foreseeing that it's just going to blend into the background of all of the other popular houseplants. It's going to become like every other plant that you know from everyone's aunt's house basically totally. yeah, yeah. Okay. it's a dependable one so are there any plants that have been trendy that your business has wanted to kind of chase are there any examples of something that you've really just, tried to be on the front end of? Yeah. oh yes just... um so something that we've been really loving lately are some of these hardy gardenias and Ooh. have you guys ever come across them before? Gardenias are one of my favorites. I love them. And I grow Climbs Hardy and Frost Proof. Yeah, exactly. And August Beauty, I think. <laughs> uh, they do really, really well for me. 
Uh, how do as, how have you experienced you know overwintering them? Uh, you leave them outside. I just leave them outside, and they come back fine. Yeah, there are two cultivars that I grow that are a little bit more marginally hardy, and they're kind of the like larger flowered, more corsage style ones versus the climbs hardy, which is kind of kind yeah. of a dull flower. Yeah, to be honest. But to also to be honest, it puts out more most flowers, flowers of any I of my it. gardenias, and when it is robustly growing. That thing will be so full that you can barely see any leaves. <laughs> I love it. Oh, That's what I love. It yeah. smells Open amazing. up your patio door and your whole apartment oh, well, smells like heaven. I usually just bring it indoors while it's in flowers so that it smells like cloying perfume inside. <laughs> I absolutely love that. And yeah. poor anybody who comes inside. That's the thing. I, You're not into it. <laughs> I know how you, much you love these. Gardenia scent is just not the best. Steven thinks what? it smells like funeral homes there's just no there's kind of like this gaminess in the scent that, whatever like, steven i i Listen. yeah well what okay. kind of fragrant flowers do you like he doesn't he, oh well then i guess That's your opinion doesn't count I, for this one right. like, like, obviously this routinely happens where matthew's like oh what well, blah something that flower that's in your home what does it smell like and i'm like oh i forgot to smell it I'm yeah like, Wait, this never occurs to him like it but yeah. I do like some of the smells. We were that in one f- is not that one's like a non consensual It's too intense. It's, it's my favorite scent. It's one of like my favorites. Yeah. For sure. me, I'm like not smelling stuff. I smell that. I, I have so been growing gardenias like. for so long that now, like, you know how memory and scent are so connected like, intermixed. For sure. yeah. yeah. To me, the smell of summer is like a combination of gardenias and marijuana smell. <laughs> like that is like that the sounds like a nice. I, that's a very good life. nostalgic yeah. memory. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I have tried growing them indoors. Gardenias fucking hate being indoors. They they're not. Yeah, they yeah. don't. They love very bright light. They love really high humidity. They like air movement. Yeah, and I will often buy. Just like the standard florist gardenias. And it'll bloom f- good, f- nicely for a month. Yeah. And then it's done. Yeah. And then it's fine. Then I compost it and go buy another yeah. one. But the hardy ones are fantastic. I so love them. you've seen those really explode in popularity recently, or have they always yeah. been popular? Well, since we, we started offering them last year, and um, to be honest, it was one of our most expensive plants that we would offer. Yeah. Uh, because most of the new cultivars, they have hefty royalties that you have to pay. Oh, and, I never thought about that. Yeah. Side. So, yeah, from a business perspective, they're very expensive to produce. Interesting. But uh, what you receive is something that is very lovely. So, yeah. But, the, the one complaint that I have about gardenias, and I feel like I'm actually throwing them under the bus for this. Their flowers are beautiful, pristine, white for the first day or two, and then they start fading to yellow, and then yeah. they get brown. And exactly. so if you're not deadheading, your plant will look pretty rich right. in a few days. But if it's in a patio container, it's not so hard to do. Yeah. Okay. And something that I like to do is when the flowers just begin to look a little bit creamy colored, I just clip them off and bring them inside. Put them in a little bowl of water. What yeah. do you do? And then that way, like as they die and dry up or you know turn yellow, they're very fragrant and then my bush is already deadheaded. Yeah, no, I for me what I'll do is I'll just take one and put it, leave it in my car. Yeah, that's like, a great way to let it let it die it. naturally in my car as I get to yep. drive away in style. I've got a buddy who does that as well. He used to live in Virginia where they would just be used as hedging plants and so wow, he'd always have like lucky. piles of dried up gardenia <laughs> flowers on his dashboard. So, we've already talked about a couple of plants that are good for balconies, but <clears throat> Before we get more into specific selections for them, what are your general recommendations of using an outdoor balcony or patio space? Yeah, you know, um, for me, the whole the energy of being kind of immersed in plant life is is one of the things that I'm absolutely positively drawn to about plants. And walking around, looking at people's kind of balcony gardens, and I'll often see balconies that are full of a bunch of tiny little pots that are just kind of clustered together, and there's really no like cohesion or maybe like there's this not is a, a strategy. There's, that went exactly, into it. Okay. exactly. There's no real strategy. And one idea that I learned while watching a, a TV show uh, presented by Monty Don. I love him. I, yeah, he's one of my favorites. Yeah, um, he was saying that. Every small garden should have one large plant. 
were you watching Small Spaces Big Dreams? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Steven I and love I that both show. loved that show. Me too. And yeah. that's where I got the idea. I was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense because when you have like one large specimen, it just kind of totally transforms the energy of your space. It kind of and gives you a grounded central point. Exactly. Yes, and and it's like and it creates variety. Um, and it just that just adds a different dimension. More recently, I've been reading this book. Uh, she created a garden called Sissinghurst, a very famous garden in England. Mm-hmm. And her idea was to cram as much plants in anywhere that you may be growing as possible. But don't just think about ground floor. You, yeah. you want to think vertically. You want to think about, you know, if you have a balcony, the the actual railing, the, you know, the, the balusters, you know, filling out all the yeah. upwards there's so many different ways that you can incorporate plant life not just on that ground plane so for me in my urban garden i have a western balcony and i have a southern balcony and in each of my little sections i have one maybe two larger specimens mm-hmm. that are just kind of beefier plants and then i have i definitely grow vines that just kind of like flail about i was training passion flower vine which is one of the very best container grown vines that will grow exceptionally fast cover a lot of a lot of space doesn't need a huge root zone Mm -hmm. um and it can handle not being watered so frequently so it's that is definitely a recommendation for um urban gardens that are pretty sunny yeah i have one outdoors now you do yeah but his is one of those weird ones that doesn't have special Um, flowers it's a very special one okay passiflora manta it's weird and sort of kind of like a black flower is it a is it a vigorous grower um i you know it's the only passiflora that i've grown um so i can't really compare it but in my like in my experience of having this i think it's been super hardy i've moved it a few times yeah. it's outdoors now but and it has it's like not... stout boomerang shaped leaves oh wow boomerang i need to see pictures of like these. a really stubby little it's not stubby i think it just lacks it lacks some of the big petals yeah mm. and it's, but it's it's a weird like very kind of black core and you really see and you've gotten like, flowers from it means. yeah i've got flowers indoors wow I have it outdoors now i i feel like i've kind of abused it so i, I like agreeing with what you're saying like yeah I've, i can handle it at each point i was like eh, i don't know if it's gonna survive this like i moved it and i put it in a really different light situation and then it got really cold and now it's still fine and then i like forgot to water like all yeah. these things and, and it's in yeah i think pot. that's one of those plants that like people think of as being super tropical but but it can actually handle much colder weather than you would necessarily instinctually think. Well, the great thing is that they have so many species and hybrids. Oh, that, there's so many cool ones. Yeah, oh like if you're picking one that's only hardy to zone 11, you can yeah. grow it as an annual or you can bring it indoors for the winter. But so many never... of them are hardy down to like zone 5, I think. At least zone 6. Yeah. For sure. There's a couple that are like really cold hardy I would not from be the northeast yeah. coast. Wow. But yeah, fantastic family of plants. And what I like about them is that What they lack in duration of flower staying power, they make up for in how many blooms they have. And some of them even produce fruit, which is kind of neat. Totally. I haven't experienced growing them inside. Um, You've had good success with it indoors. Um, Yeah. So I think, I'm trying to think if there were any challenge really. Maybe I felt like it was very hungry for light. I had it under a grow light too. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, it really wanted to grow kind of right into the what light. What did you have it trained on? Um, it was literally growing up the cord of his drapes. Yeah. See, well, that's the cool thing. That, it did that. They yeah. are very, <laughs> yeah. That's a, a my choice. one gripe with my past floor is it was eating some of my other plants alive. Yeah. So I had to be very, very ruthless about cutting those tendrils off and, and yeah. letting my other plants kind of... Uh, have some space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the one reason that I don't have any Passiflora right now is because growing them indoors is tricky because they're a climber. So if I want to have a plant scramble everywhere, right. like that's what this would do. But on my balcony, because I've done what you're recommending and I have lots of vertical space, so in front of my railings are shelves where I have potted plants. Sweet. If it were to grow on the outside where it has the most sunlight, yeah, yeah. like I've used a lot of uh, like creeping wire vine and just creeping jenny and various like mm-hmm. draping hanging vines For sure. al- along the front, but I would never get to appreciate the flowers because that's where it would want to go for the sunlight. 
and then it would yeah. really only be viewable from people down on the street. Which it means you have to go downstairs and look up. <laughs> yeah, but it's a three story. I know. Floor, I know. I'm so. on the fifth floor, so it's the same yeah. thing. I get that view from a view yeah. from afar. I need to get a drone, yeah, so, so I can start taking some <laughs> pictures. So if you were to give like a new patio or balcony gardener, an aspiring balcony gardener, some recommendations, give us some plants that you would suggest, and let's go for like on one side. Plants that you can keep outdoors year-round if your climate gets below freezing. Mm -hmm. And then maybe some plants that are better in warmer climates or that you might have to bring inside for the winter. Yeah, for sure. So um, one plant that I grow a lot of that I love are oriental lilies. And oh, th yeah. those for, uh, for an aspiring urban gardener or an aspiring gardener, just generally speaking, Lil, there, all of the different Lilium orientalis are some of the easiest plants to grow. As a bulb, you just stick it in soil six inches deep, and in 60 days, you're going to have flowers. So I'm not familiar with these. Like You would just have like a large pot? Or yeah, whatever. so what I do is I have about a 12-inch pot. So this is a, a there's so many different kinds out there, some that will grow six, seven feet tall. I stick with the ones that grow maybe two to three feet tall mm -hmm. and um, in a 12 inch pot because these oriental lilies are primarily vertical growers they don't yeah. they don't take up much horizontal space I cluster them in pretty tight in a 12 inch pot I'll probably put six and they will just they are very rapid growers and they produce loads of fragrant flowers and you can just leave that pot outside all year round. They're, most of them are hardy down to zone three, zone four. Wow. Nice. Um, so they're very, very robust growers. Uh, very and the nice fragrance plants. of like the so Casablanca fragrant. or the Stargazer lilies. Yeah. Those are just beyond anything. I know. Uh, exactly. And and as a cut flower, they last for a pretty long time. Yeah. Uh, I remember when, when we first met, I was telling you guys about these oriental lilies called rose lilies, which mm -hmm. is another thing that my family has been one of the first companies to offer in the United States. And you were also calling these quadruple lilies, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So quadruple oriental lilies came out before the rose lilies. Um, the rose lilies are kind of like an updated version of the or of the quadruple flowered lilies. Okay. And what they have is is what the name suggests. You know, four layers of petals. And you'd think that maybe oh, because they've been genetically uh, bred to produce more petals, that they wouldn't be as fast of growers or as vigorous. But not the case. They're incredibly fast growers. And they're extremely beautiful. The, Looking at some exceptionally photos Exceptionally right beautiful. Now. This is interesting. Yeah. So to me, you know, coming from such a houseplant sort of background, right? Yeah. This kind of seems like a like a merging of those worlds, right? A little bit like the, I would look at this and be like, oh, this is a landscape plant or something. Well, but, you can use them in beds really conveniently. So totally. it is so a great I, I crossover. Is, yeah, it is interesting to think of like, yeah, just get a large pot. You can put this on your balcony and you could have something that's pretty. Yeah. You know, this and is like a showstopper to me. It is definitely a showstopper. And the other thing is that I love about them is that as a bulb, you plant them, you give them water. You don't have to even think about fertilizer. I know a lot of, a lot of people, they get stressed out about when do I fertilize? How much do I fertilize? What kind of fertilizer do I use? But as a bulb, these bulbs have all of the nutrients they need. They don't, you, you can all not fertilize them at all and they will be perfectly fine. Yeah, how, how long would you expect them to remain vigorous if you planted them in a pot and just left them indefinitely? Yeah, so that's a good question because I planted some back in 2017 and about a month ago, I took them out of the pots mm -hmm. and because I wanted to see what what had what had happened underneath the soil yeah. over the last couple of years, and they turned into huge. Uh, I'm not even sure what the real technical term is. I think they are true bulbs, Just but they look different from daffodils and tulips that are more like an onion. These the little leaflets are a little bit fleshier, so it kind of looks like a Game of Thrones dragon egg almost. Yeah. 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 Well, exactly. So something like that. And so what I did was I divided mine mm -hmm. in a very, uh, you know, non-scientific technical way. I just took a took a, my knife and cut it in half, uh -huh. made sure that I had roots on each little section that I had cut and somewhere for it to grow, some, some sort of growing area mm -hmm. and replanted them, repositioned them in the containers like... 
that's not even required. You can you can just let them be. Yeah. And they will continue to produce flowers. I you know for quite a few years. You know I'm I'm at three years of having successful blooms with mine. Uh huh. And they don't seem to have depleted their flower power at all. Awesome. So I'll be interested to see how many more years they continue. I, I reckon quite a few. Cool. Yeah, because I know that tulips diminish. I don't really plant tulips. Because no, exactly. That it's way. one one year and done. But these are very very reliable rebloomers year in and year out. Nice. Cool. Now, if I was going to pick that big large focus plant, yeah, what would you recommend for a colder climate? So one that I would recommend that's awesome that I am growing is I have a reblooming lilac. It's a uh, syringa syringa myri, um, which is the, it's a quote unquote uh, Korean lilac. Yeah. And the particular cultivar that I have, it's a proven winner's variety called bloomerang. Oh yeah. Which it's a very, very catchy name. Uh-huh. <laughs> and bloomerang. Bloomerang. Yeah. And the blooms come back around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like we're yeah. back, back talking about it's a boomerang right. twice in one it's, episode. Look that's, at that. That's it's kind not, of it's hey, not, Australia. new record. I think it's not as good as pee pee, but it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty close. Yep. We're just Anyways. marketing plants all over the place. <laughs> I love that plant because it is a, a lot of the Myri, uh, Syringa Myris are. I, I'm not, I don't know if my pronunciation is correct, of course, but um, a lot of them stay quite dwarf. Uh huh. Which, as an urban gardener, that's, you know, one of the necessities. And I have mine growing in, I'd say, a five-gallon pot. Okay. And currently, it, you know, they lose their leaves in the in the winter. Um, it has this beautiful branching that is about, I don't know, two and a half feet wide and about three feet tall. Mm-hmm. And so all summer long, it's, you know, it's this beautiful bush. Here, around May, is when it produces a main flush of flowers. Mm-hmm. And then I had a second flowering, which happened in, like, September. Nice. But the second flowering it's not as it's not nearly as much as the first flowering. Yeah. But it's still it's still lilac flowers in September. Or yeah. Like who else has got that? No one. Nobody <laughs> growing syringia vulgaris. So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So like if you're in zone six or something, you can then just leave that pad outdoors. Oh absolutely. Okay. So I think that these are probably a zone four. Wow. So I think the rule of thumb is um so plants that would be like a zone four, you know, when they're marketed They'll tell you the zone, of course, so you definitely need to know what zone you live in. But it's something that is marketed as being hardy to zone four. They are saying hardy to zone four in the ground. I would, I normally would give it one less zone if you're having it in a container. Yeah, I do the same You do thing. the same. So yeah. one yeah. less as in zone As in, so zone five. zone five, exactly. Got it. Yeah, yeah. so because if you can visualize a plant in the ground, it has so much, has all of the soil around it to keep yeah. its roots warm, whereas a plant in a pot it doesn't have that sort of extra, you know, cashmere yeah. sweater on, <laughs> yeah. on the winter time. Yeah. So if you're going to be fine with dragging a plant back inside, are there any choices that you would point us towards? Hmm. Yes. Yeah, so some of the plants that I would put... So Pumeria, so, right? Pumeria, for sure. I have this plant called um, Brunfelsia yeah. Jamesensis. Yeah, so you're Queen familiar of the Night. With? It's, I haven't gotten any flowers yet, Okay. but the growth habit is so exceptionally beautiful. Mm. It's a very small plant for me. It's only about 16 inches tall. Okay. But the main, tr- I would call it a trunk because it looks like a trunk. It is. It looks like an old tree trunk that is very woody. And then the growth upwards is... It starts off as kind of like, it looks like nitrogen depleted yellow foliage, but as mm-hmm. they grow, they become more leathery and then shiny and glossy. So it's Brunsfelsia? Yeah. Okay. Brunfelsia jamaicensis. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a cool one that I keep outside in the summertime and then bring indoors. Um, another one that is beautiful that I'm growing right now are the Griffin begonias. Ooh. Are you familiar with those ones? No, but I'm excited. To they hear are about them. incredible. Uh, you know, as, as a fellow cannabis lover myself, um, they, they have a very cannabis look, like look, look cannabis like um, foliage. Yeah. Ooh, and they've got some nice silvery spots. Exactly. They do not look good in pictures. Um, uh, from from pictures that I've tried to take, yeah. I can. I, it's like a it's like a red flower. You just can't get it. Yeah, I always hate when you have something that just you cannot capture on yeah, film. Yeah, that's one of them. Yeah, that is one of them. Um, let's see what else. You know, I I grow a lot of different uh, like orchid cactus, uh, mm-hmm. epiphyllum. I also have a. Have you brought those back inside yet? I have. Okay. I, I brought it back inside. 
Not that. Actually, I brought it back in almost a month ago, but I probably could okay. have handled I just did it because I was. I've got one outside right now, but still I'm good. thinking, like, how long do I have before it's a problem? I mean, it's. I think you're knocking on the door of problem. Yeah, it'll come inside within the next couple of days. I've been pleasantly surprised at how fast growers they are. Yeah, they are yeah. exceptional. I thought that they would be like other cactus that are super slow, but they are fast. Nope, they come from jungles where they have lots of resources to use. Yeah. And I, then, I love the epiphyte are you, cacti. Are you growing any of the fishbone cactus? Yep, I've got... So which kind do you have? have All of them. This is a list. Yeah, so Stephen and I got real excited about these. I see you have one back there. Yeah, so Stephen has on a cork bark mount the Epiphyllum anguliger. Yeah. Um, which is one that I grow in a pot. We also have the Seleniocerus cristocardigram, which is the fern leaf cactus. Oh. And that one, it's like the same, but it has much thicker, fleshier. It's a little bit different. It's more coarse yeah. Cause I would, looking. I would love to see this collection and, and get the distinguishing traits. You should go over traits. to my place sometime. Yeah. Right? Actually, yeah. yeah, you know, I probably have cuttings today if you want some, cause like they said, they're so, I would take yeah. one. they're so <laughs> I have, prolific. Are you guys, what about the, is it Crypto Serious? Uh, I've not grown that one. So that's the one that I have, and that's um, and that has been such an awesome grower for me. I'm looking it up. Are right you looking now. it up? Because I, I wasn't sure. Like the same. I think it's a synonym. It's is the it same one as the oh. Selenocerius? Yeah. Yeah. So there's also Selenocerius anthonianus, which is nearly identical to the Epiphyllum anguliger. Mm -hmm. I, I think that if you're being like real particular about it the lobes are more rounded oh. a little bit less jagged but they're otherwise identical plants and the morphology changes enough that it's hard to use that well, as a definer so which one produces the white flowers and which one produces the, the pink flowers the epiphyllum has the white flowers okay and the selenia cerus has the kind of like raspberries and cream colored flowers okay that's what i thought yeah the great thing about both of those particular ones is that they bloom without the winter cold period that you need for most epiphyllum. Oh. There are some epiphyllum that are totally fine without getting that severe chill. Yeah. Like just above freezing pretty much to bloom. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that for the like traditional fishbone looking cactus, they're really reliable in that way once they're large enough. But the fernleaf cactus... Even if conditions are ideal, you may never see a bloom on the plants. They are sure. notoriously shy to flower. So you have these in hanging baskets outside or what? Actually, I have um, this one is I had it outside on kind of like on an upside down uh, on a pot turned upside down. And so I have it right now. I have it on kind of a little pedestal okay. and it just kind of flows over. Yeah. And it just looks They're amazing. so graceful. Yeah. They're so graceful. And it's like, it's like the, it's like the PP plant because yeah. it just looks like it's kind of frozen in time. Yeah. And that is one of my favorite qualities about, about that plant, about those plants. Um, that I, something that I try to achieve with a lot of my different plants. Yeah. And um, so that's one that I'll have outside in the summertime and then bring inside in the wintertime. One that I'm really excited that I want to try next year, uh, next spring to start is some abutilon. Did you guys grow yeah. any of those? I, uh, I don't know. Honestly, it's not my favorite. Like the flowering maples. Not the flowering maples. What are you talking? So those are the those are the those are anabutilon. Oh, um, okay. Abutilon mega something or other. Okay. So some of the other Chinese lantern plants. Um, oh, I saw gotcha. some at Longwood Garden out in Pennsylvania, and okay. they have just some that are absolutely phenomenal. And I think they're like a zone nine. They they can be pretty okay. tricky. Okay. Um, yeah, Could you grow them as an annual? I don't think that you would want to. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, it seems too large for that, right? They like, don't. I don't think that they actually. In a year or something. I don't think they'll get much larger than like four feet tall. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't. I don't have enough experience to say how long they would take if it would bloom the first season or not. Gotcha. Uh, but I think it's one of those plants that you could you could bring it inside. Okay. Uh, outside in the summer, out uh, indoors in the winter time. Okay. okay. So just to round out our conversation, what is your favorite plant that you're growing right now? Ah, uh, my your favorite. Next favorite. Yeah. My, well, this is I. Okay, so if it's I one have, that you've already mentioned, you can just say it's that. No, one. I haven't mentioned this it. one yet. Actually, uh, I was going to mention them. I think I spaced it. But one that I've been growing for a few years, which is by far the favorite plant that I own and in my garden, mm -hmm. is a tree peony. 
Yes. I oh, freaking love it. Did you guys talk about this before? I we, feel like we probably we spoke about it about um, PAC, when we yeah. when we first like, met. Wait, yeah. What are the chances that oh my God. you guys independently like these? Yes, tree peonies particularly. Which uh, one are you growing? So I'm growing it's a Peonia sufruticosa. It's I don't know the cultivar, but it's a yellow flowering one. Oh, okay. And so I started it from um, this is a pure non grafted tree peony, which is very it's hard to find. It's on its own rootstock. That's, that's Absol- awesome. Yes. So it, in America, they're very very tricky to find. Mm-hmm. Um, something that my family has specialized in in providing to the American gardener are pure tree peonies, and so that's I got it from from my family and um, planted it in. 2017 in mm-hmm. May of 2017 as just a bare root I had uh, it grew into about like a two foot by two foot wide plant that first season uh-huh. I didn't get any flowers but then the next year I had maybe three or four flowers mm-hmm. in May and these flowers are insanely beautiful they're like as big as your head they're as big as your head they are just the the richness of the color is something that you just you cannot uh, it, it just can't be matched. Yeah. And then just the growth habit of this in a container, freaking phenomenal. Um, I have it in like a, I would say it's probably a 10 gallon terracotta pot. Yeah. It's, it's like a hundred pound plant. Yeah. Um, and um, so that is easily my favorite plant. It overwinters perfectly fine here in a container. They're very hardy. Very hardy. Yeah. Um, very and the special long lived perennials. Oh. Very long lived perennials. But the special thing is, as opposed to the Peonia lactiflora, the traditional mm-hmm. garden peonies. The herbaceous ones. The herbaceous ones. You know, those need that period of winter freezing, whereas tree peonies do not. So that makes it more accessible for more gardens across, you know, the country. Yeah. That's a huge thing. We are almost too warm here to reliably get blooming peonies anywhere yeah. warmer no, for sure. in the winters. Would be, yeah. Yeah, the Bay Area has to be careful about which ones they pick so that they actually get reliable flowers. Yeah, but I'm sure they would be wildly successful with tree peonies there. Yeah, I put several of them in my mom's gardens that I had been growing on. Uh, the balcony of my old apartment, which had ton of very bright, sunny space. So she has a huge collection of my, my old peonies now. And I think that my favorite one, it's not the hybrid that it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. I ordered it from China on eBay. And I found that you can't really always rely on getting what you think you're buying. But it has... Even when you're buying in bulk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that is probably something that plagues the market beyond my complaints. It's tough. Yeah. Mm. I'm glad that I gave this plant to my mom, though, because it has these fuchsia flowers. They are huge. It is wow. not a color that I like. I am so glad that they're in her garden because they look spectacular. They look great. She loves them. But I... I told you I'm coming to your mom's garden next spring. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting a peony it... to her. This... Well, garden sounds sweet. comes several times because we have planted her garden so that it just has like all these different phases oh that it gosh, goes through. It's kind of designed to look like a cottage garden slash like spring meadow. Uh, sounds beautiful. It's really special. We both really like it. Okay. So I think that that's all that we want to grill you on today. Um, do you want to plug anything before you go? I know that you're super active on YouTube and Instagram. Yeah. Tell us about those. Um, on Instagram, I go by Plant Vibrations, uh, which is long form for Plant Vibes. That's my that's one of one of my many alter egos. So <laughs> if you ever see me in the streets, just call me Plant Vibes. Okay. Um, will, will you respond? Hell yeah! What's yeah. up, Plant Vibes? <laughs> What's up, Plant Vibes? <laughs> um, so you can find me on there. I'm very active, and I also have a YouTube channel. Uh, plant vibrations with Devin on YouTube. Um, okay, I try yeah. to be pretty good about answering questions. So I love hearing questions that you guys are having at home. We've if you're, if you're troubleshooting plant issues. Um, I find it highly interesting and engaging. So uh, feel free to to send me messages and and I will do my best to respond to that. Um, and that's about it. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming to join us. We really appreciate your chat. Super great hearing about your family business. Yeah, and this is some good inspiration for like container gardening. Yeah. Just like I was saying, as a houseplant person, you know, I think of myself like as a houseplant person primarily. Yeah, what can I put in pots outdoors? Well, um, other yeah, than just, Saracenia. You know, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what it was. Or it's like, we're going to oh, get you what? onto fragrance. Oh, yeah, it's totally different. Please though. help me. Yeah, it's, it's totally different. It's like, it's like, Right now, I think so many of us honestly will think about houseplants and then we're like, oh, we have an outdoor space. Yeah. So 
which of my house plants will benefit from the sun and being outdoors. That's really how. But wow. it's it is really cool to kind of see how the outdoor garden fans and the indoor garden fans are overlapping and kind of learning from one another. Yeah, Devin, you are the ambassador. Yeah. Okay? You're going to bring bringing, hell yeah. these worlds. Bringing old style outdoor gardening to a younger millennial that's audience. Right. That's that's my mission. Yeah. That's my mission. Well, I'm sure that you will succeed. All right. Well, yeah. anything else before we wrap up? No, thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, thank you so much. So this has been Plant Daddy Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And like I said at the top of the show, don't forget to like, subscribe, recommend. If you enjoy what you hear, please give us a five-star. I'm going to start this sentence over. If you enjoy what you've heard, please give us a five-star rating and tell your friends. If you want to be in touch, you can always email us at plantteddypodcast at gmail.com or check out our social media. On basically everything, you'll find us at Plant Daddy Podcast. We are looking forward to you tuning in next time. So thank you for listening. Happy growing. And happy Thanksgiving. It's my favorite holiday. Oh, yeah. We might actually get this out before Thanksgiving. Well, that's the goal. Otherwise, I don't know what we're publishing. (laughs) Fingers crossed. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Bye.